This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today, we're talking with Jalen Malone and Beverly Magdanong of Mostra Coffee in San Diego. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I'm your host for the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me for this Founder Friday for October Uh, It's actually Filipino American History Month, and today's episode has a deep connection to the Philippines as both Jalyn and Beverly share that heritage and it is essential components in the mission of what they do at Mostra Coffee. So I'm really excited for you to listen to this story. Now, really quick, if you have not yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening to this show and also share these episodes with a friend. Share the show with a friend or with your team. Now, on top of doing this podcast, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. Keys to the Shop Consulting is where I get to work directly with you to help you start your business off on the right foot or to help you level up your existing business's operations, quality, management, and people. A lot of ways we can do that, whether in person or remotely. And if you're interested, I would love to set up a free discovery call where we can talk about what your situation is and if working with Keys to the Shop Consulting is a right fit for you. So to do that, just email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. And we can set up that call and talk more. Love to hear from you. Now, today's Founder Friday episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers, curating the most amazing equipment from all over the world, and then working with you to make sure that you're getting the right equipment for your coffee bar. There's a lot of stress that comes with purchasing equipment because there's a lot of choices and you need somebody to help guide you in that. Working with Prima Coffee is the way to go. Check them out over at prima-coffee.com if you're in the market for espresso machines, grinders, brewers, or even things like uh, under-counter refrigeration or smallwares. And right now you can get 5% off your order by using the code KEYS5 at checkout. That's K-E-Y-S and the number five at checkout. And that'll give you 5% off your whole order over at prima-coffee.com slash keys. And again, for all of your commercial coffee equipment needs, I highly recommend that you work with Prima Coffee. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. Their extensive and complete lineup allows you to offer your customers the absolute world's best in plant-based coffee experiences uh, because they create these beverages for professional baristas and with the feedback of some of the best baristas in the world. So you'll know this is truly a performance beverage. It stands up to the heat from steaming, has amazing silky texture, and provides flavor balance in the cup. So the focus is on the coffee. These are formulated to perfection. Go to pacificfoodservice.com to learn more and get these in your shop and try it for yourself. If you're looking for the best in plant-based beverages to serve your customers, then you need to be serving the Barista Series from Pacific. All right, everybody. Well, welcome to another Founder Friday episode of Keys to the Shop for the month of October. I'm really excited to present this conversation to you. It is a great success story of family and friends coming together to do something truly spectacular in coffee. And we're talking with two of the co-founders of Mostra Coffee in San Diego, California, Jalyn Sophia Malone and Beverly Magdanong. So Jalyn Sophia Malone is a Filipino-American entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman, philanthropist, actress, TV host, producer, wife, and mother of two. She is a co-founder and owner and acting chief marketing officer for Mostra Coffee. And she is dedicated to making positive change that uplifts entire local and global communities. With over 15 years of marketing experience in Hollywood, Jalyn has been instrumental to the growth and international success of Mostra Coffee. Now, Beverly Magtanong is a Filipino-Canadian-American entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman, philanthropist, wife, and mother of five children. And she is a founder and co-owner of Mostra Coffee. As a classically trained opera singer with no prior business or coffee experience, Beverly is inspired to empower others to find their true, authentic selves and make intuitive and empathic entrepreneurship the norm in the industry. Their company, Mostra Coffee, is a specialty coffee roaster located in San Diego, California. It is the recipient of the internationally coveted 2020 Micro Roaster of the Year awarded by Roast Magazine. 
The company has been a dynamic presence in the coffee scene since its inception, known for its hospitality, its culinary collaborations, and for creating a very special coffee experience. It has been featured on Forbes, US Weekly, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Bon Appetit, as well as the networks of ABC, NBC, and Fox, to name a few, and has also been featured on Google Talks at the Google headquarters. Today's conversation takes us back to the very beginnings of Mostra Coffee, and Jalyn and Beverly do a fantastic job talking about making the change from their entertainment careers to coffee careers, what they learned in the process, how they drew inspiration from their background to create the kind of experiences that they wanted to see at Mostra Coffee, from humble beginnings in a garage to a warehouse to now multiple brick and mortar stores, and it seems that they're just getting started. This is a really great success story, and we get really in detail about how things evolved, the lessons they learned in each phase of their business, and the mission that has sustained them from the beginning to do their part to eradicate poverty and serve as a platform for giving back to the Philippines through Mostra Coffee. So with that said, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with two of the co-founders of Mostra Coffee, Jalyn Malone and Beverly Magtanong. Well, Jalyn, Beverly, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Super excited to have this conversation. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about you all, especially after you've won the uh, Roast Magazine Micro Roaster of the Year in 2020. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. That <laughs> must be a pretty cool uh, achievement after all these years. It was dream come true for sure. For us, when we had started, we heard about this award and we have followed the award and the people that have won the award. So it's extremely humbling to be one of the winners. So this is not something that's easily achieved. It's nothing that's overnight about being successful. Um, so mm-hmm. I want to start this conversation talking about, you know, how you transitioned from your careers in the arts. Jalyn, you're an actor and then Beverly in uh, mm-hmm. the opera world, which I'm totally unfamiliar with. <laughs> a lot of people are unfamiliar (laughs) (laughs) yeah but then you decided to start coffee i mean how did this come about for you this is a question that we get a lot um because it does seem like they're two totally different worlds right entertainment and coffee but i mean to take it all the way back jillian and i uh were doing a lot of charity work for the filipino community and We went to the Philippines in 2009, and when we were there, we learned a lot about social entrepreneurship. We visited a lot of farms, and we came away from that trip just wondering how we could help basically in our own way eradicate poverty. And they told us if you wanted to do that, you know, the best thing that you could do is source something from the land um, and give it a stage, basically. The Philippines has so many different resources. They just haven't had a lot of opportunity to bring it to the world stage. So that has always been separate from our entertainment and performance careers, but that was a mission in our hearts that we've had for a very, very, very long time. And so when the opportunity came to actually start this company, um, we took it. Now, when people say, how do you go from being an entertainer to, going to coffee, how does it relate? At least for me as an opera singer, there's been so much crossover. Um, Mm -hmm. Just everything from the grit it takes to be a stage performer, one, um, that vulnerability that you have to have every single time you get in front of an audience has given us the, the thick skin that it takes to be an entrepreneur, I think. Everything from just the little details that we have to pay attention to as an artist and as a performer, as an actor, has directly crossed over to being an entrepreneur and all the details that you have to look at and pay attention to as you grow a business has, for me, been very, very similar. For people that aren't performers and don't have that performance background, um, like, you know, if you look at... um, somebody like, I don't know, Lady Gaga or JLo or, you know, even Michael Jackson. I mean, I would even go to like an athlete like Kobe Bryant, you know, um, absolutely. There is just this level of like discipline in order to like perfect a craft. And you have to get as close to perfecting that craft because it's such a competitive industry to be an athlete or a performer or something like that. So 
unless you're just lucky, which totally happens, you know, you have to have a craft that you've mastered to find success in the entertainment industry. So for Bev and I, like doing entertainment our whole lives, I mean, since we were kids, we have just been programmed to just continue to push, to grow, to elevate. So with that comes this, like what she said, grit that like, you just kind of, you're just in this mindset of just working really, really, really hard until you get it right. Um, you have to show up. It's like when JLo is like on this or Lady Gaga are on the stage to do like the Super Bowl. Like there's just so many details that go into like that entire production. And then like when they're there and you're under pressure and like, you know, your costume might have is falling apart or the dancers are in the wrong space or, you know, like you just you are in no position to like stop performing like that, that saying the show must go on is something that like performers are just trained to do. Like things are falling apart. You keep going. So in business, it's the same thing. (laughs) It's the same thing. And like, you really are almost unfazed when things go wrong in business. And at least for Bev and I, that's been the case. And yeah. And like she and I, like, you know, you're not supposed to do business with friends. Like, you're not supposed to do business with family. Like Bev and I have been hit, our, our, and our partners, our company have been hit with all kinds of regular like business hurdles. But like, we continue to just keep the show going. And we are not like actually as phased as we see like other people in business being phased by things. Because I feel like we're just in that like constant, mindset of you just got to keep going like you don't stop like things happen and you keep finding ways to like elevate that performance regardless of things falling apart Mm -hmm. I don't know honestly it's been everything Mostra is Italian for performance right it is yeah that was very intentional I mean because we're performers first you know and we were like how can we take our performance background and use it as the inspiration behind many aspects of our business. There's just so much that goes into perfecting a craft. And we know as performers what it takes to get close to having to perfect that Mm -hmm. craft um, and getting to that level of performance. And so we wanted to translate that into coffee and basically do the same thing with coffee and pay attention to all those details, everything from how you roast, you brew, how you serve your customers, um, how it's presented, what it looks like, so that we could get that coffee experience to that level of performance that we know is amazing. With the grit of your past in arts and now applying that to coffee, you then also have the mission of the company, which I believe maybe no small part is a motivator to Uh, keep the show going, so to speak, uh, because once you said yes to that uh, opportunity or you just looked for an opportunity to be able to develop a platform to help the Philippines, um, you're beholden to more than just your curiosity about a craft. If you had just decided to do a coffee bar because you you enjoy coffee and that's it, that was your only mission. You're like, I like cool coffee. Let's let's do a shop. There was a lot uh, mm-hmm. deeper meaning here that it must factor into helping you get over the hurdles, regardless of the grit that you developed in your uh, careers. That's actually a hundred percent true because mm-hmm. during the pandemic, right, businesses were closing down left and right. People were, I mean, permanently or temporarily. And for us, I mean, I can tell you right now, like I was freaked out by the unknown of everything that I was like, kind of panicked, like, guys, I think like, should we shut down? Like, should we close, you know, because nobody knew what was going on or like the seriousness or not of this whole issue. So what kept us open was our mission. It was like, well, if we shut down, then there is a chain, a negative chain reaction beyond just like our business here in San Diego and our online business and our customers across the U S we were thinking, you know, what about everyone in the supply chain, all the farmers in all the different countries that we source coffee from who are counting on us for their livelihood. So you're absolutely right, Chris, like that has been 
constantly what has kept us going because we know that this business is more than just ourselves. It's not a, it's truly not about us. Mm -mm. And when we started this thing, Bev and I, I mean, this is probably the worst thing to tell small business people, (laughs) but like we were honestly not even thinking about the money because, and honestly, like we have to remind ourselves even now to think about the money because of our own livelihoods and our families and (laughs) all that, because we are, are literally so immersed and like dialed in to our mission and it being about others and helping others and serving others that like we forget the whole picture which is you got to take care of yourself too <laughs> obviously but it is it has really been a driving factor for us this entire time and i think that because we are so mission centered and because us four owners there's four of us know that and believe wholeheartedly in what we do this is why this partnership works so well is because every decision that we make everything that we go into always has to answer the mission that we have for this company Mm, so it's everything yeah Mm -hmm. the unifying factor the no matter your differences you've got this thing that you're, you're all serving that's great how did you take your first steps with this in mind, it's an ambitious goal. Uh, when you first start a coffee shop, even if you have ambitious goals like this, you're just trying to get off the ground and you've got in your head, okay, you know, one day we're going to win this award. One day we're going to like substantially give back to the Philippines. And But in the beginning, you're just trying to make it work on paper and <laughs> in, in, in mm-hmm. just the little microcosm of your world there in San Diego. What were the first steps to begin the process while keeping that big goal in mind? Well, I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit because every time we are having these kinds of conversations where we, you know, visit the very, very beginning of our journey, um, mm-hmm. I'm always like, wow, we're freaking crazy. Um. <laughs> well, because, well, because like really, it was like, we were just like, our mission again was just so strong. That it was just like undeniable. We were going to do it all. And yeah, there was like, like no doubt. There was like no doubt. And I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, and I can't say that I feel that way about like other things that I do or think about pursuing the way that I do when it came to most stress. Um, but it was like the, the beginning phase, like, the beginning phase of it all was really just let's buckle down and like learn as much as we can about what the heck specialty coffee even is I mean we like bought a roaster before even learning how to roast so there was actually like it was more like day-to-day right Bev wouldn't you say like it was like day-to-day like on the job in the moment figuring a lot of different things out but again we were just so confident that it was just going to work and we were going to figure it out and we were going to pull certain people in that could help support that, including, you know, ourselves as an actor and an opera singer. We were like, no, we can just, we can just figure it out. So it was definitely that just like learning. And then it was a lot of like convincing our families to help somehow give us money, give us money <laughs> to buy a roaster and to buy coffee. So Bev was able to convince her mom. How much was that first roaster, Bev? It was a one pound San Franciscan and it was $10,000. Okay, $10,000. Um, <laughs> yep, and so she gave us that first seed money for that. And then Jalyn's grandparents gave us about $5,000 to buy our first four 125 mm-hmm. pound bags of beans. It was Brazil, an Ethiopian Yirgacheff, Guatemala and Sumatra. Indonesia and Sumatra. Mm-hmm. Because when, you know, we had started this whole thing wanting to source coffee from the Philippines, but when we actually asked these green bean coffee distributors and we were trying to source Philippine coffee, like nobody knew what we were talking about. They're like, we don't have Philippine coffee. We didn't know coffee was grown in the Philippines. It was like unknown to like the biggest distributors of green bean coffee in the United States. And we were like, well, and even then, Chris, like we had started this thing and then like people around us are like, we don't have Philippine coffee. We were like, it's fine. (laughs) We're going to source coffee from other places around the world. 
and we are going to somehow basically manifest find our an way opportunity to, the to find <laughs> Philippine coffee at because we point. had nobody we had no connection to coffee there or in coffee period to be honest um mm -hmm. Yeah, we convinced our families to give us money. And then we plugged this thing in at Bev's house in her garage in Forest Ranch. And, you know, we brought on our other partner, Mike Arquinez, who's a fine dining chef. And at the time, he had a catering business. And honestly, <laughs> we found him because we had done a charity event with him. So we became Facebook friends. And I'd see him posting stuff on Facebook and he would post photos of latte art. I don't even know if they were personal photos that he did at home or if they were at coffee shops, but he was literally the only person we knew that was posting pictures of coffee. And we knew nothing about coffee, like to the point where like, we didn't have coffee machines, brewers at home. We didn't drink coffee. You know, we, if anything, we'd go to Starbucks and buy like a caramel frappuccino with extra caramel and extra whipped cream to dilute the flavor of coffee. So he was the only person we knew that knew maybe something about it. So that's how he was brought on. And it turned out that he had always wanted to roast coffee and he had, he had home roasted like on a, what did he say, Bev? Like an iron skillet or something. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Cast you iron know, skillet. Cast iron skillet, you know, and so he was like, I don't know how to, you know, like he didn't know how to roast coffee or how to use this machine, but he just applied his culinary background, cooking to roasting and developing the flavors of the coffee bean. And that's literally how we roasted. So you all were roasters first and then yes. the retail expression uh, came about after you were developing your your uh, prowess and and roasting or or pop did you do pop ups and then a, a brick and oh burger? my god mm -hmm. we did a lot I mean that was our bread and butter was pop ups for sure it was Every actually event. not um, <laughs> till a few years later that we actually had our first you know brick and mortar coffee shop so we spent a lot of years doing you know roasting wholesale. Um, that's when, you know, we do a lot of craft beer collaborations that all happen during that time. But then we would, um, we had our warehouse. So eventually once we were out of the garage, we had uh, locked down a couple of pretty good wholesale accounts. And that's what um, got us out of the garage and into an actual warehouse. And when we were in the warehouse, we started doing these craft beer collaborations that we're really known for now. And people would just show up to our <laughs> warehouse and we would, you know, be there labeling our cold brew bottles or <laughs> labeling yes. our bags. Um, and they would think that we were actual coffee shops. So they'd walk in and they'd be like, uh, can I get a cup of coffee? And we're like, oh, we're not that kind of shop yet. So we we're like, well, you know, people keep stopping by here. Maybe we should just open a few hours, like a couple of days a week. It started out as one day a week and it was convenient for our schedules with our kids in school. So it was like 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. randomly <laughs> on a Wednesday. <Right. laughs> yes. And and it started one day a week. But Chris, like it just it was one of those really organic things where people would just show up from nine to two and it'd be really busy that we would mm -hmm. be forced to open another day. So it's like, okay, let's do Mondays. Mm -hmm. So then it was Monday, Wednesdays, then it was Fridays and Saturdays. And then it, it was just crazy. That's how our Yelp started growing organically. Um, and then it just got to a point where we needed to just get a coffee shop. So it was actually a few years until we actually opened one. <laughs> Yeah. And even then finding a coffee shop in the suburban neighborhoods that we live in in San Diego is the uh, hardest thing to do because there's a Starbucks or a coffee bean in every single center. <laughs> and if they're, and they, they've cornered the market. So they're like, you know, they have exclusivity rights to every friggin' shopping center and you can't find yep. one. So it was just, it just so happened that one opened up in a center that didn't have one and we were able to make it work and finally open up a real true coffee shop. 
all the years that you were roasting and, and you were diving headfirst into developing your palates and um, buying better coffee and roasting, and, and you became more adept at at that. I'm sure that there was um, you know, many um, many different sources that you were looking to to create. Uh, better product uh, throughout that time. I mean, what were your main sources of inspiration and, and also things that you were com- comparing yourself against to say, are we do- are we doing this right? Are we getting better and better? Was it just your group or did you have uh, people I- included in that group that were also coffee professionals to tell you like the honest truth about how c- good of quality your coffee was? I mean, I'd say like it started with just us. And a lot of it was a lot of trial and error. There was a point where we were all taking hand in roasting, but Mike, our business partner, primarily was the one who was leading all of the roasting. That was, he was our head roaster. You know, Mike in general just has a lot of friends <laughs> mm-hmm. in a lot of different industries. Um, and so I would say that he would talk a lot with just people in the coffee industry, um, going to different shops always letting people, not even necessarily who are into coffee, but just like in the foodie world, um, in the beer world, try our stuff and always just continuously getting feedback. Mm -hmm. Again, like going back, like we did a ton of pop-ups. So because Mike, you know, is a chef, he would do a lot of these food events around town and he would bring us on along to these events. And so we had a lot of opportunity to get our product in front of a lot of people with extremely um, sophisticated palettes and Mm -hmm. would give us feedback all the time. We developed uh, very good relationships with the folks down at Inter-American in San Diego um, who would cup coffee with us as well. And it was really just learning along the way, I would say. And I would also add to that, that we, Okay, like we are in a part of San Diego that doesn't have a ton of specialty coffee either. Um, Now we do, but back then it wasn't. Yeah, before we were literally, I mean, there was not a ton at all Mm -hmm. Um, versus, you know, like places like in downtown or like the coastal cities where there's like a ton more specialty coffee roasters um, in a smaller area. So we were kind of like for a while, kind of just like out here on our own. Also knowing that like we did not start this business with all this coffee experience, which I almost feel was kind of beneficial to us because we kind of like did our own thing a lot. You know, we were like, um, let's dive into cold brewing. And then, you know, Mike would literally just take like his own culinary experience and background with flavor. And he was like experimenting with finding ways to introduce and fusing ingredients that were not standard to coffee, like traditional coffee. And Back then people weren't doing it. Right. Today, different, but in two, you know, 2013 and mm-hmm. um, 2014, I mean, like Starbucks wasn't even like big on cold Serving brew. Cold brew yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we were just we were there, we were bottling them. We were putting like all kinds of flavors in there, coconut, vanilla bean, cocoa nibs, um, tea. So we were just like pushing the envelope in ways that nobody else that we knew of at the time was doing kind of just being innovative on our own anyway, because like, we just weren't going down some like traditional, like coffee path. I think that a lot of people had, because like we were, we just didn't have that. I mean, at least Bev and I did it. Mike definitely did, but he's just, he's a chef. So he was being a chef and being a chef is being innovative with flavor. I think that was something that actually helped us. Cause we just, we were extremely innovative and pushing the envelope and we've continued to, I mean, we were doing things like barrel aging, like our cold brew in um, beer barrel, like barrels that had beer at one point, bourbon at one point. I mean, just all kinds of things was seasoning meat with it. Like it was just like (laughs) trying all the other things that you could do with coffee that I think played like a huge part in like just us developing like our business. And no doubt your confidence was increasing as you continued down that path. And a lot of people, and I, I like your point that this was 
more of an asset than something that should be it was de- detrimental because so so many of us in coffee or any business really if we have too many examples that we're trying to follow we don't even really find our own voice we don't uh, yes it, 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 you absolutely one of many copies of things and it business wise mm-hmm. it may make sense like on paper but it, you might not find the soul of your business in that correct i completely mm-hmm. agree Mm -hmm. For sure. So now when you began offering coffee to people in the warehouse, there's a, there's a change of mentality that happens when you go from head down, filling bags of coffee, um, tending to the, uh, barrels in the back of cold brew and whatever other experiments you had going to actually just being customer facing and serving a latte, serving some, some coffee, uh, drip coffee or something like that. It's another aspect of coffee that requires um, that more of that performance. You know, up until now, it seems like being a, in the roasting, you're kind of performing for yourselves. But mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. when you get to serving people, now it's really like it's not rehearsal, so to speak. What kind of experiences did you have running basically a cafe in your warehouse? And then how did that experience translate to how you designed the brick and mortar experience? I love this question so much (laughs) because like my partners and I, we love people. We love connecting with the community. And, and then as performers, we love creating experiences. Like it's why you become a performer truly like you. I mean, yes, you're passionate about it, but like being able to bring an experience to people is everything as a performer. So for us, it was like so exciting to do. And, and then like culturally, all of us are Filipino American and culturally it's a very, like, I would say a hospitable culture. We love taking care of people. We love like the energy of community and bringing people together and, um, and all of that and hosting. So the second we were able to open it was just like it elevated all of our experiences. We built so many relationships with people in the community to the point where like some of them are like family friends to us today. Um, but we were also utilizing what we had in the warehouse was, which was like a bunch of, you know, we had a coffee cart in there, but then we had a bunch of like stainless steel tables because those were our working, mm-hmm. those are our work tables. So it was kind of like we used what was organically there And because like, literally we would close up at 2 PM for the day, and then we would shift it all back to production. And we had to just make shift a space that worked for both, um, which then allowed us to just have this very open interactive um, exchange with customers. Cause it was, um, you know, most coffee shops, the baristas are all hiding behind their equipment. You don't even know who's making your drinks. Like the only person you really ever see is the person that takes your order and the person that hands it off barely, but everyone else back there is hiding behind all the machines and you don't even know. But for us, because we were in the warehouse and we were, this was the setup that we had in that work space. We had like our espresso machine on top and then all of our, and then it was just very open. Um, and then with our name being Mostra and all of us being performers and wanting to create that experience, we were able, like we actually catered our menu to create a show and experience for people when they were watching their drinks being made. It was really intentional, even in the warehouse. And we found mm-hmm. that we were able to interact with everybody and create this like open kitchen kind of experience that when um, my husband, James is actually the one that designs our spaces. He took that exact model and translated over to our retail spaces where now all of our shops are very open kitchen um, to the point where we use a Mavam espresso machine, which is an under counter espresso machine. Mm-hmm. So you see everything being made from start to finish and it has worked for us. and everyone that we hire are all people that are similar to us where they love people. They love the interaction and the exchange of energy between people in the community. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's been really cool. And then the other fun thing was in our warehouse, we had a communal, we had this like 
plastic um, folding table <laughs> that, you know, you would put up like at a park or something. Because again, it was like our workspace. We would just <laughs> pop that open in the back of our <laughs> roll up door and people would gather around it. Like everyone from different groups would just stand around this one folding table and they'd become friends. They'd exchange stories. They would network. I mean, it would like all this magical stuff would be happening at this table. And then we ended up in our first retail shop. We had to have a communal table and that's what we did. And it's this like big grand table under this beautiful chandelier that you know, we were inspired by, by the retail days in the warehouse. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we were utilizing things that we had in the shop, not knowing that it would be setting the stage for how we built, how we build out all of our shops. Mm -hmm. um, it was just stuff that, you know, was, was laying around. It was not cute at all. You know, the, no. the canopy it's like a regular easy up blue canopy, you know, your mm -hmm. six foot, you know, plastic folding table with plastic chairs with no, um, with no linen on it or anything. Cause no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, again, it was not cute. And as like performers ourselves, we were like, Oh my God, this is such an eyesore. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the people we called these, like the OG most of our customers, HQ. these people, mm -hmm. these people miss that so much. They miss like, their hole in the wall underground almost speakeasy. like a easy yes yeah, speakeasy coffee shop i think it was cool it was a, it was a, lo a lot of opportunity for r d for us to see what works what doesn't work um and so by the time that we actually moved into a brick and mortar shop we knew exactly what we wanted it to look like feel like mm -hmm. um because we had that experience in the warehouse with those customers already. That's very cool. It, it, it reminds me of the kind of, you know, uh, when you see street performers that are doing amazing things in subways and on street corners, and then they have like a, a, a regular show and they just take off from there, they're discovered because people were just videotaping them on their phones. And they probably miss that vibe, like an irreplaceable vibe that you have when everything is just so... Uh, electric in the beginning. Yeah. And then people were so excited because they interacted with the owners during every retail day mm -hmm. because we were the ones running the operation. We didn't have staff, you know, for a while. So, you know, it would be all of us like, oh, okay, everyone, let's get there at eight. And then it would, you know, be Bev and I, I'd be on register, Bev's on espresso, Sam's doing pour overs. I mean, it was like, now, like when people see us in the stores, they're like, oh my gosh. We miss seeing you guys. And it's like, I, I mean, we miss seeing them, but you know, we're, we're drowning on the back, you know, the back end. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta grow the business. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So now speaking of growing the business, you, you transition from being at the warehouse now fully to a brick and mortar, and you've taken your cues from some of the things that you observed during the service uh, in the warehouse and now put them into place in the brick and mortar. Um, but on top of that, I imagine that you are also hiring in order to staff this new expression of retail for Mostra. Um, how did you go about, I, I know you mentioned that there are you know, people who are sensitive to that performance mentality where they want to create an experience. I mean, practically speaking, how did you end up pursuing staffing for that? Again, we're performers, Chris. <laughs> so we're extra always <laughs> in everything that we do. And that includes our interview and hiring process. Mm -hmm. um, my husband, Sam, who's one of our business partners, leads that. And it's, it's not um, an easy process. They go through three interviews, if they even make it to three interviews. It starts with our managers. They'll do a pre-screen. And then if they pass that, they go on to our director of coffee operations. His name is Ryan Sullivan. Ryan does his own interview with them. And then if they pass Ryan, then it goes to Sam. And then Sam's interview is like at least two hours. <laughs> it's like a two hour therapy <laughs> session. Everybody it, cries yes. in their interview. Everybody cries. Um, and it's not, you know, like for us, if you have coffee experience, that's great, but that's not what we're looking for because you can teach anybody coffee. That's mm -hmm. the truth. But for us, we want to know who you are as a person, 
what motivates you, like what is at the heart of you as a person. Um, and this is how, and it's really about the person and, and the people. It's a long process, but it has worked for us. And honestly, we have such amazing staff with the best hearts, the most giving mm -hmm. hearts, um, who see the vision and the mission of Mostra. And part of that mission is, you know, be um, the reason why people see goodness in humanity. And every single person that is with us really exemplifies that. Working the bar, um, the day-to-day -day, uh, cares and minutia and challenges of coffee bars are the same pretty much around the world. So when somebody comes in to uh, be a staff member at Mostra and they've passed through all mm -hmm. of that and they're on the bar, I mean, what are the uh, kind of things that you're looking for people to practically do when they're under the gun for, you know, like a, you know, three hour nonstop rush or when, when they're not just caring for customers, but they're also caring for each other in the process of caring for customers. I mean, how does that look when you walk into a, your, one of your bars, say, we mm -hmm. know that this is working and we hire the right people because look at what they're doing, even though this stuff is happening. Well, I will say that our, a part of our mission statement is to be the goodness in humanity. I know that's a very like, like Miss Congeniality kind of um, answer when they're like, what, you know, if you win Miss Universe, you know, what are you going to do? And they're like, world peace. And we're like, be the goodness in humanity. But we mean that on a local and global level. Since our mission is like so tied to truly helping, there's people that make coffee, a great cup of coffee, and maybe some of the best cups of coffee that you have. And then there's people that make the best cup of coffee, but they're also spreading love, warmth, creating an environment and an energy exchange with individuals as they're coming in that bring light to your day, to your life, to the community, to each other. I mean, like, I actually do lead the customer service training and I don't go so much in depth with like, the technicalities of what to say and how to handle things by some sort of script by the book. I actually focus more on just the heart of being a good person and like creating an environment where people feel like, like our staff, when I'm training them, I'm like, treat everyone who comes into the, through our doors, like they're a guest at a party that you're hosting. Because when you're hosting a party, no one ever walks in the door without you saying hi you check on them, you know, you're just, you have constant awareness as a host of a party of your guests and making sure that they have the best experience from beginning to end. You know, um, a lot of the times when people at a coffee shop get a coffee, like they hand your coffee off and it's done. There is no further interaction um, with those people, but I'm there encouraging our staff, touch tables, make a connection with somebody, um, you know, have that extra awareness to um, and intuition about like how someone's day is going and see like how you can help brighten their day, help them out, create additional support. And again, not only for them, but with each other on all the team that's working with them that day. So it just kind of keeps everybody like aligned in a space where we're just being good people and inspiring others to be good people too. And I have, and I've had people, so many people, and you can even see it in our Yelp reviews. Cause like, I mean, not everybody's going to like our coffee. And we get these Yelp reviews where someone's like, didn't love the coffee, you know, like I prefer Starbucks or I prefer something, you know, whatever, a little darker or a little lighter. But like, they'll say that, but then they'll be like, but the staff was so warm and wonderful. And like, they'll still say something good. And I'm like, look, if we can at least get that, I think we're winning as a business that we're at least being good people out there. Um, and we're brightening people's days. And honestly, like our Carmel Mountain shop in San Diego gets crazy busy, especially on the weekends. And those kinds of rushes do happen and it can get very overwhelming for the staff. So for us to encourage that continuously, make a connection, make sure you smile, like be aware of like how 
you know, you're presenting yourself, you know, when these customers are there, you know, that's the difference maker between getting that like one star Yelp review and the five star Yelp review when they're Mm -hmm. waiting, you know, a while for their coffee because there are so many people. So we get these Yelp reviews where it's like, you know what, it was crazy rush, took a while for my coffee, but you know what, like they were so friendly or they were so aware that like I was waiting for a while that they were like, here's a free drink card. It's just that continuous reminder of just being aware of the situation and, you know, and being super hospitable because giving a free drink card, like, what is that to us? You know what I mean? If it means that you have a happy customer and somebody that's going to return back. I think it's really interesting as we talk about performance that in some people's minds, when we think about performance, it's a very me centered thing. Like, let me show you all the talent that I have in this category of life uh, Mm. that I've developed. And Mm -hmm. but but from what you're describing and creating an experience, it takes it to that deeper level where it seems like it's not necessarily you that's performing, so to speak. It's more like the customer is the star of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's the the whole point that you're all you're all serving uh, their needs, which you would kind of balance out that view that this is like, you know, in a barista competition, the coffee is being made by one barista and they're on stage and it's all about them. From your hiring practices to all that you've been talking about, this pretty uh, humble and earnest, uh, hardcore approach to hospitality and others focused, detail oriented service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I want to also emphasize too, that even though we emphasize, hey, performance and creating that experience, you know, another message that is always said, which, you know, Sam is always telling them is find your own voice, perform, but perform as authentically yourself, you, Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such an important thing, because I think when people sometimes hear the term performance, or perform or put on a show, you're having to put up a facade, which is not what we're trying to say. We're saying just be yourself mm. because you're an amazing person. <laughs> right. We hired you for that. And when I did say that, yeah. Sam, make, say, everyone cries in their interview with Sam. It's not because like he's like beating down on them at all. It's literally <laughs> because he's like, he's digging into like parts of their heart and soul that they've maybe never have either realized, articulated, articulated or ever expressed. And he's just like, you know, so we are like literally... And that's what we tell them. Like, we hired you for you. Like, you're all uniquely you. So be authentically you and perform at your highest level. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, and when you do that, obviously, um, if you have a contrived way of doing it, that's really just cut and paste. Um, or it's going to pass along the culture of uh, that not being you to the customer. What made the difference? Like, what was the point at which you started to get traction on that original vision and started to see that you've built this business up to now you can source coffee and you actually see uh, the business starting to give back to that uh, original vision? Being able to source Philippine coffee was a very serendipitous thing. Um, so I'm just going to take it back there to give some context, but my husband's um, mother's family are still farmers in the Philippines, specifically Mindanao. And they have friends, farmer friends who lived up in the mountains um, that actually grew coffee. So that was our first tip on, you know, our first connection to coffee, to Arabica coffee in the Philippines. And so my husband, Sam and his dad went over there and got a few samples of coffees from this farm. They brought it back here to the States. And we actually took, you know, one lot that looked good. Again, we were not very trained on any of this stuff, but it looked good to us, looked like the other coffees we had. So we took it down to Inter-American, they cupped it, and they actually scored it a 92. Wow. That was our first. So we bought the entire harvest from that farmer and um, gave him that fair trade price. And I swear it was like he won the publisher's clearinghouse. Mm-hmm. He was able to send his son to college. Um, it was a dream come true for us. So that was our first experience mm-hmm. with actually sourcing that coffee, bringing it here to the States, roasting it and actually selling it mm-hmm. here. And then we made some more connections along the way and we connected with Calzada. 
And Calzada is a company out in the Philippines that also champions um, not just Arabica um, coffee, but also really high quality Robusta as well. But this is where we've been getting our coffee since then. And Jalin and the team actually went out there, was it 2019? Mm-hmm. The beginning, the beginning and, of 2019. Right. And went to the farms and we actually purchased a lot of coffee from their farms out there in Sitio Belize, which is in Benguet in the Philippines. And then um, it was when we won Roaster of the Year, right, Lynn? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That I think we really started gaining traction. So we have, um, not only do we sell single origin Philippine coffee, but we also have uh, what we call our ghost bear espresso blend. So this is the espresso that we use in all of our cafes. Um, We also sell bags of it, but it has Philippine coffee in it and it's our number one selling coffee. And a Mm -hmm. ton of people don't even realize that there's Philippine coffee in it. They just love it because it tastes amazing. And so we just keep selling so much of this coffee Um, And it's awesome because, you know, we get to continue furthering our mission of helping the people in the Philippines um, and and people get exposed to Philippine specialty coffee. And it's holding on its own because the quality is so great. And you all have developed the business to be able to distribute it at a volume where it's sustainable for you to kind of continue that, you know, relationship. Otherwise, you know, doing it when you were smaller and just starting out, you know, it, it was it would be a nice gesture, but now you've got more power of distribution because of just what you've built, your notoriety, and it, it, it's obviously a much more uh, symbiotic relationship. Yeah. So not only, you know, do we have it in all of our shops, it's the espresso that, you know, is used in the shops. Every single person that purchases a cup of, you know, espresso um, at our shops gets ghost beer blend in there. But we also do a lot of craft beer collaborations. People have done things with Philippine coffee as well. So we're really being able to distribute it to a lot of different areas. And honestly, you know, the challenge here in the future is being able to source enough and Mm -hmm. for there to be enough coffee um, at the farm level. Awesome. So now you have this, uh, all the pieces in place, it seems. When we started the conversation talking about what your goals are, you've got sort of this good problem of saying, well, how can we source more and more? And we've got this team of people who are uh, on mission with us, right, to uh, accomplish this great hospitality and create this great experience. And You've, you're an award-winning roaster, and you just opened your third store, and so that whole uh, evolution of your your uh, retail brand now it, it seems like you know what's the next step beyond this for you? What are the plans for Mostra going forward? Well, we actually have a fourth store that we are about to start building out. I mean, like any day, like maybe tomorrow. Nice. <laughs> it's like we're there. So we have a fourth store um, in San Diego. It's in an area called Mira Mesa, um, which we're really excited about. And a lot of people from that neighborhood actually go to our shops already. So they're very, very excited about it. Um, And then we actually have two additional stores. Um, We recently partnered with one of the largest developers in San Diego. Uh, They're called HG Fenton. And they were the ones that we partnered up with, with our most recent store, our third store in Bankers Hill. And they have a couple other developments and um, down in Hillcrest and North Park that we are partnering with them on. So we have those stores coming up in the next couple of years here. And we have plans on opening up in San Francisco. Um, We hope. Yeah, we hope to be in other areas like Los Angeles, Las Vegas, New York. Um, And then we actually have another origin trip coming up um, at the beginning of 2022. And we hope to explore opening up some locations in the Philippines as well. Oh, wow. Full circle. That is really cool. Exactly. Um, Yeah. Full circle. What's the challenge there when you're talking about all this expansion? It sounds like cool, (laughs) awesome, 
really cool. Yeah. <laughs> but there's mm-hmm. logistics involved. You mentioned earlier how, you know, you're buried with a lot of what I imagine are the logistics of having this company expand and scale the way it is. So how is that managed on your end? So I think that just like any other small business, you know, your challenges are always going to be cash flow, right? Um, capital, um, resources, staffing, you know, there's only, when it comes to all the strategic business development, there's, there's only four owners. And so that is a challenge because, you know, we are all four of us still very operational in the day to day. Here's all of these dreams and goals that we have. How do we get there? How do we find all the resources for it? And there's definitely different options. You know what I mean? There's always people that are looking to invest. It's just really having to navigate through what's the right path right now, because we're definitely in this growth phase. We're no longer a startup anymore. You know, we're seven years in, we're in a growth phase right now, um, trying to get to the next level of growing our business. And so there's a lot of different avenues, just, you know, I'm talking, you know, back end stuff where um, do we get a strategic investor? Do we take out institutional funding instead to retain most of the company right now as we continue to build. So these are the kinds of things that we're having to navigate through and decide on and really just um, dig deep and say, okay, you know, what what route do we want to take? What kind of company do we want to be in the future? So I would say that's, at least from my vantage point and what I do in the company, that is definitely um, one of the biggest challenges for sure what company you want to be? That's an interesting question. And it makes me think about the transition between the warehouse cafe and the brick and mortar and the Mm -hmm. the difference between those two expressions. Do you think that this growth phase is uh, like another version of that kind of leap from like maybe this brick and mortar is the warehouse and then multiple retail locations, even internationally is, is the new expression in and what things are you yeah. like hey these are the non-negotiables that we have to keep that we have observed are the values uh that even at scale we need to keep these totally you, you know i think you're right oh sorry go ahead no i think that um and i think this this part of this talk is is very interesting to people in the audience out there that may be thinking about you know getting into coffee, having any kind of business or at a point where they're also in a growth phase. But, um, you know, when I'm saying what kind of company do we want to be, you know, do we want to open up several of these shops in San Diego? You know, that's one thing in Southern California. Do you want to be very um, strategic as far as opening in major cities only? Um, Do we want to grow e-commerce more? You know, there's so many different things that we can do. Um, And I think that at the end of the day, we need to ask the question ourselves, like what is really going to answer that question of, is it furthering our mission? Is this the right move for our mission? Are we gonna be able to maintain like that vision and that mission through these decisions? Look, I'm like like trying to think of these answers myself as I'm talking about them. (laughs) Right, right. Well, but these 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 are the questions, right? I mean, it's it's continuous. It's uh, and they're big, big decisions. They're not um, ones that we just make easily because it can just change, you know, the whole trajectory. I I was just gonna say that you know, like I'd like to think that it was it it was a similar thing, like. You know, we were in the warehouse, then we transitioned to brick and mortar, you know, and then like that was like a different version of us. But like, honestly, we are not your standard coffee roasting company. We're learning this as we continue to grow. I mean, we've always known this, but like we've created a very diverse company because not only do I feel like more traditional coffee roasters, like they roast coffee for wholesale and then they do retail, then they do e-commerce and that's kind of what it is. And it's great. But because of who we are as people, we just like a lot of things and we are really trying to create an experience. And when you're trying to create an experience, then it's this like full immersive thing that like we have found works for us. So like, 
you know, with Mike being a chef, obviously we are now diving into food. Um, and you know, we're doing food through our anniversary party. Like things are evolving into cocktails and liquor spirits. We already work with the beer community. So like there have been talks over the years, jokingly and serious, like, do we get into the beer craft beer space? Like as a brewery, because we have really built up a super strong and organic um, following in the craft beer community um, through our hundreds of maybe even thousands now like collaborations that we've done. Yeah, over a thousand. Okay, so over a thousand. So like there's that. It's just a very intensified growth phase right now. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, when when you say growth phase, I'm, I'm curious about, um, it, it sounds like a growth phase, like w- with a kid, the kid doesn't really pick the growth phase. It just like happens, right? <laughs> They're just, <laughs> yeah. With a business, you're in the driver's seat a little bit with this. Is this mm-hmm. something that just came about and you're along for the ride and saying like, let's direct this as best we can, but we got to take it. Or is it just something that you've plowed through and cultivated and this is the growth growth phase we have decided this and not necessarily fate it's both for me i think it's both mm-hmm. i would can we just you tell know, him that one story really quick like at the beginning of the year we had our company meeting with our leadership team we decided in the driver's seat we were not going to open any more retail locations we're in the middle of pandemic It's a bad time to open up more retail locations. And then like literally two weeks later, HG Fenton came to us and was like, we're interested in working with you guys and opening up a retail location, you know? And then we were like, well, there's that, you know? And then like, it's just, it's both like just a lot of, I think like a lot of like the seeds that we have planted over the last seven years are growing whether we're aware of them or not, they're growing. And so a lot of organic things are just kind of happening on their own. And we're then having to come up with a decision to pursue something. And then we're actually pursuing some things as well. Yes, it is definitely a combination of that. Um, I think also um, the, the, where our, our business is right now, financially, we're at a point where, you know, we can get institutional funding. We're at a point now where we have people, you know, pretty um, uh, large investors that are approaching us and saying, hey, we want to grow with you strategically. Mm -hmm. And they want to give us significant, you know, amount of money. So there's this, there's more opportunity now to be able to really significantly grow the business. And so when I say growth phase, it's just all these opportunities that are here to really take the business to the next level. It's just determining on like what we want to do, you know, so just on, you know, the back end side as a business owner, when you're in this phase, you know, it's, hey, do we take on a strategic investor, give a large part of the company and grow it like crazy? Mm -hmm. Do we faster, um, Mm -hmm. faster, right? That's always sounds like appealing. Mm -hmm. but it's scary because now you're bringing in somebody else from the outside when it's been the four of us and we've had a hundred percent control of the company. Um, Or do we take institutional funding, retain the business on our own, keep growing it so that the valuation of the company increases that way, when we take on a strategic partner, you know, we're not having to give away that much of the company Mm -hmm. for X amount of money these are the kinds of things that we are trying to figure out and juggle right now. The idea that you have um, developed your own voice early on, that you did your own thing and had the curiosity to pursue all these different channels and you, and you viewed that as an asset and you pursued it in your own way. Like you said, found your own voice. Now that you have all these opportunities, if you didn't have that, then I imagine these uh, decisions would be harder to make or they would be scarily easy. In other words, you wouldn't be able to Mm -hmm. see maybe some obstacles or things down the line that you're like, now you're able to see it. Like, this is not us because we know who we are. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I I just, you know, we have proven to ourselves 
that you can pursue a business, um, a career change, a all kinds of things um, without having like all of that experience and doing exactly what you're saying, like being authentically you and finding your own voice. And we've made it this far. Um, so there is this level of like trust that there's something magical going on that we have. Um, where we have, cause I mean, my gosh, I'm thinking about like these other opportunities where people were throwing down, like, you know, a ton of money for a lot of control of the company. And <laughs> we stayed on path and we were like, no, like, you know, like we said no to the money and it was like scary too, to be like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Are we sure this is the right decision? And then, I mean, we are extremely happy with where things are today. And yeah. we were able to do it. Now, I'm not saying that's going to be the path forever because, you know, things just get busier and more intense, right? With like growth and expansion and and all of that. But um, I definitely feel that like the partners and I have this level of trust that there is magic that we have been able to create up to this point that it makes it easier to say no to something because we have found a way over the years. But it's exciting, you know? Like I said, these are great problems to have. I think that Jolyn and I and our other partners, you know, we're just in the grind every day, putting our heads mm -hmm. down, working, working, that, you know, we don't take a lot of time to step out of it and see everything that has been built over the last seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I can honestly and truly say that every day is a very, very humbling experience for us. Mm -hmm. And you know, just, you know, for the first, like how many years, you know, we were doing everything ourselves, including all of the back end stuff. And mm -hmm. so just the past, you know, couple of years, we have this back end financial team, we have a legal team. And it's like, wow, guys. Wow. This yeah. Is legit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're legit. But it's honestly, just, it's, it's yeah. so surreal. It's just, it's surreal, like where it started, where it is right now, what the plans are for the future. A lot to I mean, figure out, but it's really exciting. And it's also like when we get to sit down and have interviews like this, Chris, I'm telling you, this is what's literally going to happen. We're going to get off of this interview. <laughs> Bev and I are going to call each other afterwards and go, oh my gosh, did we do all of this? Is this our company? We do this like every time because we hear our own story out loud and we like take a minute out of the hustle like she said and then we're like blown away that like we did it and then it lasts for literally like four minutes and then we're like okay anyways anyways okay so what do we need to do and then we're like back to it but like at the beginning we'll of this be back call, to anniversary planning <laughs> yeah well because at the beginning of this call like I started a text to Bev I never actually sent it but like I was like literally crying listening to Bev tell our story I was like oh my gosh that's so true. <laughs> we did that. Like, you know, it was just to relive it all and to really step out of it is like humbling. So humbling. Um, like I still have, I say this every interview and I swear it's not scripted. I like still cannot believe we won roaster of the year. It's now we're like approaching 2022 and I'm like, what we did? <laughs> like I say it, I can't believe it. Honestly, I can't believe we have three stores. I can't believe we're building a fourth store. I can't believe we have like all these employees and like HQ is running on its own. And I haven't been there to pack a bag of coffee or cold brew or no one's ro like, you know, Mike's not roasting. Like, it's just so, so surreal to really realize like what we have today. When people are like, oh, you know, like, how, what do you think it's going to feel like to like reach your dreams or whatever? We're like, we're living the dream, man. <laughs> Today. We're in it. It's happening mm -hmm. right now. The hustle, all of it. That's the dream. And we get to do it together, which is so fun. You know, like Bev and I have like the best relationship. We have honestly, everyone out there truly, and I'm not saying get in business with your best friends, but like we have not fought, not once. Mm -hmm. in all the seven years Amazing. because we've just been like yeah. so our brains our hearts our mission has been like so synchronized um from the beginning 
that like that is how this has worked I think people get together like oh this is a maybe a good idea or a convenient thing to do or you know yeah we want to start a business together because Bev and I've been talking about starting a business since high school you know we've talked about doing business but it was like we were just really 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 on the same page with everything but we didn't discover that like we discovered that from being friends for so long and finding ourselves truly on the same page with like 90 eight percent of the things in life so being able to run a business together successfully and i hope it continues that way <laughs> but <laughs> seven years in Seems seven years have gone in good so far yeah, yeah seven years in like you know my husband works with us you know obviously her husband's our business partner mike's our other best friend like we are truly enjoying it. My family works for us. I've got si siblings that manage stores. My dad used to pr like do all of our cold brew. My father-in-law used to deliver all of our coffee. <laughs> I mean, we just, we brought everyone in. My other sister is helping us with like assisting us on pretty much everything we're doing right now. It's, it's a family affair, but we're having so much fun doing it. Man, it's been really a lot of fun to hear the story. It, it really is. Uh, amazing to hear about your partnerships and the evolution of the business and where you're going with it. And knowing yeah. about how you are so focused on the mission and you have your identity already squared away, it gives so much uh, hope to see you know what you're going to accomplish in the future with Mostra. So thank you both so much for being on the show and, and sharing this story. Uh, where can people go to learn more about Mostra and just stay up to date with all the magic that you are about to create in the future? Absolutely. Um, you can follow us on our website, mostracoffee.com. That's M-O-S-T-R-A-C-O-F-F-E-E.com. There's always stuff up there. If you'd like to try our coffee, our online store is there. Um, Obviously, there's the social media platforms, there's Instagram, which is, I would say, is the most up to date um, social media platform. Um, and it's just, it's simple. It's just at Mostra Coffee. And yeah, we are so, so, so honored that you invited us on and you allowed us to hear our story <laughs> <laughs> as we were sharing it with you. Um, but thank you. It, it is really, truly um, so awesome when anyone cares to hear, you know, what we're doing and we love to share it with everybody. And when people do really ask us for business advice, like it always starts with the mission. We're like, if you are mission led and like you just are passionate about why, like your why, then like you could really create some magic for yourself. <laughs> the opera singer and Clearly. the actor turn coffee roasters <laughs> are telling you that it does not yeah like you can you really can do anything mm. if you are mission led for sure yeah. best performance of your life literally yes. <laughs> thank you both once more absolutely thank you, so thank much, you. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. A huge thank you to Jalyn and Beverly for joining us on the show and all of the work that you've done at Moster Coffee. It really is inspiring. And in this conversation, one of the things that I walk away with uh, as far as impressions is just the power of mission to push you through the hardships um, with starting from not knowing anything and very raw experimental uh, phases of their business. The mission always sustained them and pushed them, um, as well as having very specific values and high standards and, and building their business mindfully. Um, of course, keeping the mission in mind, but having high standards for themselves that, of course, they mentioned they learned through their entertainment careers. Uh, all of these things converged along with their great relationship with each other and with others that they lead with at Mostra to create what is today obviously something that's making a difference and experiencing enormous success. So if you want to learn more about Mostra Coffee, just go to their website, mostracoffee.com. You should also follow them on Instagram at Mostra Coffee. And also coming up on the 30th of this month of October, uh, if you're in the area, definitely make it over to their seventh year anniversary celebration called Mostra Land uh, happening on October 30th. 
You can find more information over on their website as well as their Instagram account. Again, that's at Mostra Coffee. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback from me about this episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, feel free to email me. That's chris at keystotheshop.com. And that's also the email you can use to inquire about Keys to the Shop Consulting. Chris at keystotheshop.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode today. Thank you everybody so much for taking the time to listen to the story of Mostra Coffee. Hope you found it truly inspirational. Have an awesome day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.